the browning boys by pansy chapter one looking forward behold the heaven of heavens cannot contain thee behold a greater than solomon is here keep thy heart with all diligence for out of it are the issues of life the fear of the lord is the beginning of wisdom i love them that love me and those that seek me early shall find me there were two of them red-cheeked hardy-looking fellows but their faces were rather sober as they sat one on the fence post the other on the horse block this november morning ben was whittling as he was apt to be alec rested his elbows on his knees and his face on his hands and looked away at the blue hills at last alec said it seems as though two great strong boys like us ought to be able to do something well that isn't exactly the way i put it let's do something i say agreed but what will it be now you are farther along than i've got it stands to reason that there must be something we can do to help but what it is i can't say if a fellow only knew said alec there's a chance beckwith is looking out for a clerk jim bates told me about it and i stopped in there last night when i came home from the freight office and had a talk with him i thought if it were just to sell tape and things i would do as well as an older one but he said his clerk had to make up his own cash account and strike a balance whatever that is understand bookkeeping you know so there's no chance there that started ben on a new train of thought did you know old mr stevens was going to start his night school again and he's going to teach bookkeeping the boys over at the rolling mill are going to join the class that would be a good chance for us sixpence a night said alec i know it might as well be two shillings a night it is the old story of the cow and the elephant then they laughed again you couldn't expect to know bookkeeping old fellow you never had a chance to learn that's the rub never a chance to learn anything ignorant folks can't do anything we aren't very aged said ben no but then we're growing older every day and when is the learning to begin we'll never grow wise by whittling or hoeing gardens the fear of the lord is the beginning of wisdom ben did not say these words aloud they just flitted through his mind he had heard them often enough that morning to fix them father and mother and little effie and alec and he had each repeated them at family worship here we are almost twelve years old and we haven't begun to learn anything yet that's so said ben with energy but he did not mean what alec did he was thinking of his father's prayer after the verse had been recited so many times o lord give to each of us the true wisdom to guide us this day ben knew just what the fear of the lord meant and he knew that he and alec had not begun to get wisdom he wandered off into the thoughts that this thought suggested until it brought him to this remark george strong is going to join the church the next time did you know it no how should i i didn't know he hadn't told you he told me last sunday night when we were coming home from meeting he says his mother is as pleased as anything more pleased than if he had found a fortune for her presently alec said one can't do a thing of that kind just to please one's mother no of course not but it made me think of the verse what verse why the one you have heard five times over every morning this week oh said alec it is about wisdom it is about the beginning of wisdom and you said we hadn't made a beginning yet i don't want to talk about george strong said alec speaking sharply i'm more interested just now in trying to contrive how we can raise a thanksgiving dinner for mother a thanksgiving dinner yes just that i know it's troubling mother it will be the first time in five years that she can't afford a turkey and invite mrs strong and george to dinner 
but if george has got so far ahead of us maybe he can get the turkey himself and take us in ben was dumb with astonishment and a little pained for nothing looked less likely than that his mother would spend any of her hard earnings for a thanksgiving turkey even for the sake of having mrs strong to dinner who had never failed to be present at a thanksgiving since her husband met his death by falling from the roof he was shingling for the brownings well why not he said aloud and thoughtfully in fact he was thinking aloud rather than talking to alec just as likely as not it means wisdom for every day that's the kind george needs i don't know but his religion is going to help him get dinners and everything you make me think of another bible verse what's that behold a greater than solomon is here ben's face was grave that verse means jesus christ you know there was rebuke in his tone a curious thing happened to the brownings that very evening george strong came his eyes shining he had been at work all the week doing errands for the corner market and that evening the master of it had told him not to plan for his thanksgiving turkey for he had one picked out for him and mother said would mrs browning be so good and so kind as to just come for once with her family and eat a thanksgiving dinner with them she had wanted to do it all these years the boys exchanged glances and alec said speaking low for only ben to hear it looks as though he were getting wiser every hour the next morning the new verse for the week came into use in the browning family ben repeated it slowly i love them that love me and those that seek me early shall find me how much did it mean george strong had sought and found him what had he found with him End of chapter 1chapter two a true friend be not among wine bibbers wisdom excelleth folly as far as light excelleth darkness remember now thy creator in the days of thy youth for two years the brownings had been steadily growing poor not that they had ever been rich but so far as ben and alec were concerned they might have been the boys had always found breakfast waiting when they came in from doing farm work and dinner waiting when they came from school they had worn clothes that were patched but the patching was neat and did not trouble them and when the coat grew too shabby a new one was forthcoming somehow boots were ready for them in the autumn and new straw hats as the summer opened what more did the boys want their father might have been worth millions for all they knew or cared but this was when they were little fellows so they said thinking of those happy days rather contemptuously so far as their share in them was concerned they were older now the first day of november both had become twelve years old for two years they had known that their father was poor and for at least a year they had known that he was growing poorer he was a carpenter by trade and had at odd times built himself the neat and pretty little house in which they lived but one day he grew in a hurry to have the kitchen done and worked out in a steady rain not thinking much about it until suddenly he felt chilled and sick then followed a sickness long and hard the doctor's bill and the drug bill ate up all the little savings and worse than all the father did not grow strong after the illness he coughed a little and walked feebly and took cold easily and was easily made dizzy when he tried to work on high places as he used to do his step grew slower and there were days together when he could not work at all the boys gave up school for a while the mother said cheerily until father gets better they helped about the house they worked hard in the garden they did any and everything that willing hearts and nimble fingers could find to do and when the father could work at all he worked beyond his strength and still the brownings grew poorer 
they went to mrs strong's and had a good dinner on thanksgiving day as good as their mother had made the year before and better than she could have had this year and from that time aleck knew though he would not own it even to ben that george strong was ahead somehow ben thought much about it wondered whether george's new notions had to do with his finding a first-rate place to work at good wages had to do with a good many things which had happened lately it was a clear cold winter evening mrs browning's kitchen was neat and clean and a good fire burned in the stove the brownings had entirely given up the keeping of two fires the boys remembered the time when a fire used to be started in the stove in the little sitting-room as regularly as after dinner came but that had not been done this autumn mrs browning was busily mending a pair of trousers which ben had split in the knees that very day it is too dreadfully bad mother he said gazing ruefully at the gaping hole i tried as hard as ever i could not to tumble for i knew the shabby old things would go and burst at the first chance but it was so dreadfully slippery and my old shoes are worn as smooth as glass never mind said mrs browning waxing her thread and taking hold of the wound with vigorous hands it is a good thing that the trousers broke and not the knee clothes will wear out of course these have done well for being made out of an old pair to begin with i shall have to put in a patch but it is almost exactly like the cloth and won't show much where's your book ben why aren't you at work aleck will get ahead of you cuz said ben glancing over at aleck who sat with one elbow on his knee his forehead resting on his hand the other hand holding up an arithmetic at which he stared in such an absorbed way that he had not heard a word of the talk i guess i won't study to-night mother aleck is ahead of me anyhow and one evening more won't make much difference mrs browning looked up with quick alarm in her eyes don't you feel well ben i'm afraid the tumble on the ice hurt you more than you have told ben laughed cheerily no it didn't mother i'm good for a great deal harder tumbles than that my bones are used to it i only wish my clothes were they are the only part of me that is delicate mother i thought i would go down street to-night then the mother looked again and the troubled look grew stronger and showed in her voice without aleck yes mother he doesn't care to go i don't care much about it myself but i almost promised if you are willing i wouldn't she said coaxingly i wouldn't stir a step out to-night it is real cold and your coat is none of the warmest and it is so nice and cosy here your father won't be home till ten o'clock and aleck and i don't want to stay alone do we aleck and nine are twenty-three said aleck but that don't make it how on earth is that what did you say mother were you talking to me never mind his mother said smiling on him i mustn't interrupt the figures ben my boy you won't go out if mother doesn't want you to i know of course not ben said heartily but i almost promised george that i would if you were willing is it george strong i thought he did not go out on evenings he has since the meetings began what meetings ben why prayer meetings and preaching some of the time they have them every night and this time it is just for young folks what is the meeting there is a man from some other town who is going to preach a sermon to the young folks he preached last night and folks like him and that is where george wanted you to go yes mother i don't suppose it is so very cold after all and it isn't far down to the church if you want to go you might fold the little gray shawl for a muffler was george going to call for you yes he said he would stop on his way down mrs browning glanced at the student who seemed not to have heard any of this talk then sank her voice lower 
why doesn't alec go with you he doesn't want to mother he said he wouldn't outright when george asked him and besides we wouldn't want to leave you alone i shouldn't mind that there was a stamping of feet on the doorstep and ben made haste to open the door and let in a gust of wind and a tall boy with a tin pail in his hand good evening he said briskly it is warmer in here than it is outdoors but it is a nice night you're going aren't you ben mrs browning mother wants to know if you will accept this pail of milk the lady she irons for up on the ridge sent a great pailful to her this afternoon she says it is more than she can use before it sours and she thought maybe you would like some it is so much nicer than what you buy of the milkman where is effie asked george not ill is she oh no not ill mrs browning said but completely worn out she has had a hard day in school the poor child misses her brothers then the two boys trudged away isn't that a nice pail of milk mrs browning said heartily to her boy who was left but alec frowned and ran his fingers through his thick hair and said i don't want the strongs to be sending milk to us mrs browning only sighed at this it did seem a strange turning round of things to be receiving gifts from the strongs but for all that she was thankful for the milk i know what the text is going to be to-night george said as they turned the corner and reached a broad path where the two could walk together he told us last night what it would be remember now thy creator in the days of thy youth i never could understand what that verse meant ben said a body isn't likely to forget who made him i don't know about that i think lots of folks do not out and out forget you know but act as though they belonged to themselves and it was nobody's business what they did don't you say and do things that you wouldn't if you always remembered that you belonged to god belonged to him repeated ben why yes if he made us we belong to him don't we and what i say is that we act as though we belonged to ourselves as they went homeward george said well do you understand what it means now yes ben said slowly only i think it is hard to do what to belong to jesus it isn't it's just as easy how could anybody remember him all the time you have to think about other things it isn't that you think about other things now but you remember your mother without much trouble if you are going to do anything you think whether your mother would like it and when you want to please anybody would a good deal rather do it than not you know why it is easy enough to think about it i will tell you what ben i cannot explain it to you but just you try it and you will see how it is i don't know how to try it why just begin say you will and the thing is done saying you will isn't doing a thing yes it is if you mean it if you said you would go right straight back to the church and meant it you would turn around this minute and go yes but this isn't going anywhere oh yes it is it is going exactly where he tells you to go you don't do it all at once you know it is every day you try it ben it will never be easier didn't he make it plain to-night why we should begin in our youth ever so many began there to-night i thought you would i couldn't said ben huskily but you will won't you i don't know it is different with you you have your mother yes i have mother but then ben you need his help all the more and he will help about everything every single thing i need help ben said his voice still husky then they reached the narrow path ben was almost home there was no time for more end of chapter two chapter three 
A GREAT CHANGE And upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached unto them. Repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. The will of the Lord be done. Ben stamped the snow from his boots and went into the neat little kitchen. His mother sat there alone. She was sewing, but the big Bible lay on the table before her, as though she might have been reading or might be intending to do so. Ben hung up his coat and cap and sat down a little way from her and looked at the fire. "'Where is Alec?' he asked. "'Alec went to bed a few minutes ago. He seemed pretty tired.' "'Hasn't father come home yet?' "'No, he said he would be late, perhaps. "'Mr. Akers was to tell him about a piece of work he wants done. "'Did you have a good meeting?' "'Why, yes, I suppose so. "'What is a good meeting?' "'Mrs. Browning laughed a little. "'Why, it is a good meeting,' she said. "'It isn't easy to describe. "'Were there many out?' "'Room full.' that is good and most of them young folks i wish alec had gone no there were a good many old folks or at least men and women there but the sermon was to young folks why do you wish alec had gone oh because i would like to have him interested in such things and you too i would like it better than arithmetic or anything else for you a boy isn't safe in this world until he has settled mother do you believe everything that there is in the bible why of course ben i don't know what would become of me if i didn't and she sighed a little what makes you ask such a question oh i don't know it doesn't seem to me as though folks acted as though they believed it now that about praying and getting things you need if it is true what is the use of worrying about whether everything will go right of course it will, if God takes care of it. Mrs. Browning laid down her sewing and looked with an almost startled gaze at her boy for a few minutes. Then she said, That's true, Ben, and it is no fault of the Lord that it does not give us comfort all the time. It is our poor weak faith that refuses to trust him and that thinks things must be going wrong because we cannot see the way. You used to cry sometimes when I carried you through a dark room because you couldn't see where to go. You thought you were going to be hurt, and there I had you safe and knew I could take care of you. I often think of it nowadays. It is just about as I trust my Heavenly Father. Then she sighed again. They were still for a few minutes, then Mrs. Browning glanced at the big Bible. Don't you want to read a few verses to me? she asked your father may be quite late getting home mr akers is a great hand to talk when he gets started i haven't had time to read today i need to finish this work as quick as i can so ben drew the bible toward him where shall i read he asked and mrs browning gave the book and chapter and told what pencil mark he would find at the verse where she stopped and he presently began testifying both to the jews and the greeks repentance toward god and faith toward our lord jesus christ there it is said mrs browning now if i had lived like paul and testified of my faith in jesus christ you would have been sure that i believed the bible oh mother ben said i was sure of it all the time i didn't mean that i know but then it is true as you say that people don't act as though they trusted christ i worry a good deal about your father's health and about how we shall get through the winter and about you boys being out of school and i oughtn't to do it i can trust the lord about great big things somehow better than i can about the little ones what does that verse mean anyhow well it means most everything I was thinking, as you read it, if I had just lived that verse, I would do my whole duty in every direction. If I repented of everything that was wrong, repented of it so heartily, you know, that I asked God to forgive it, 
and then trusted everything that Christ has said, I would be a wonderful Christian and a happy one. You never did anything wrong, said Ben sturdily, and he shut the Bible with a bang. I don't believe I can read any more tonight, mother. Well, said Mrs. Browning, you needn't. That verse is enough to last me for the rest of the evening. I wish you would take it for your verse, Ben. But Ben had no answer to make to this. He lighted a lamp, said good night, and went off upstairs. Alec was asleep. The room was cold. Ben made all haste about the business of getting ready for bed, blew out his light, and tucked himself under the clothes. There he lay wide awake. Two sentences seemed saying themselves over to him. Remember now thy Creator in the days of thy youth, and repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Wasn't it time for him to remember his Creator? The sermon had been very plain. What had he to repent of? Many a thing, he knew that. He well knew enough that a boy who had known all about the Saviour for as many years as he had, and yet had never honestly tried to serve him, had a great deal to repent of before God. I've treated him meanly, and that's a fact, he said, turning restlessly in bed, but I don't know what he wants me to do. What of that? Can't you trust him to let you know what to do? Who said that? It seemed almost to Ben as though a voice spoke the words. But Alec was snoring, and his mother was downstairs. He could hear her moving around the room. A long time he lay there, his eyes wide open, thinking, thinking, and at last he said aloud, in a clear, firm voice, I mean to do it. He covered his head with the bedclothes after that, and what he said next was spoken to God. Not many words, just a simple, O oh God, I have made up my mind to remember my Creator now. I repent of everything wrong. I want to do right. I want to believe every word that Jesus Christ has said as fast as I find it out. Take me for a servant, for Jesus' sake. Amen. It did not take more than a minute to speak these words, but they made the greatest change in all Ben Browning's future life that words could possibly have made. He never forgot them. And, what is more important, God never forgot them. He had the name Benjamin Browning written down that night in his book, and the angels heard the news, and they smiled as they talked it over. Another soldier for the king, among the boys, too. Ben Browning, aged twelve. End of chapter 3「Chapter Four: A Serious Charge I am ready not to be bound only, but also to die at Jerusalem for the sake of the Lord Jesus. And I said, What shall I do, Lord? And the night following the Lord stood by him, and said, Be of good cheer, Paul. Ben Browning awoke the next morning later than usual, so much later, indeed, that Alec was dressed and gone. As soon as Ben was awake enough to take in that fact, he made all speed with the dressing. Indeed, the room was cold enough to give him nimble fingers. Still, when fairly dressed, he lingered. He had by no means forgotten what happened the night before. Life was different with him. He knew it and felt it. Just a moment he stood, with a curious look on his face, partly of pleasure and partly of awe, then he dropped on his knees by the bedside. He must begin the day with prayer. Among other things, he prayed about work. If he could only find something to do, some way to earn money so that he could help. He went down at last into the warm little kitchen. Effie was bustling about, helping with the breakfast. Alec had gone to the grocery for a little tea. Ben took the empty pail, filled it with water, brought another armful of wood for the box, then stood watching his mother while she carefully measured the milk for her johnny cake. Alec bustled in with the tea. "'Done up in newspaper!' 
said mrs browning in a reproving voice i never saw tea put up that way before he said it was most too little to do up at all alec said i do wish i didn't have to go after such little dribbles of things it was not too little to charge for it seems the mother said as she carefully counted the change it is four pence more to the pound than the last we bought bring the caddy effie and i will put it in right away i don't like tea done up in newspaper she tossed the paper to the floor and ben caught it a late paper for a bit of the date was on the corner quite a large piece and one side of it taken up with the advertisement of a children's magazine a list of premiums for getting new subscribers one caught his eye at once a complete printer's outfit with type enough for printing handbills small advertisements cards and indeed if one might judge from that paper almost anything that a boy could print ben's cheeks were in a glow how often he had thought that if only he had a printing press he could print the handbills that mr mathers was very fond of scattering through the town advertising his goods and he could print cards for ladies and texts for the children and scores of things if only he could get ten subscribers for that magazine at eight shillings each it looked like a large undertaking but the more ben thought about it the more he was sure that he would try it why not it was only asking people suppose he didn't succeed no harm would be done all the while the johnny cake was baking he stood looking out of the window apparently watching the steady fall of snow but really planning how he would begin his work look here he said to alec at last for a while he thought he would say nothing to alec about it then he decided that that would not be brotherly he would offer alec a partnership humph said alec what of it a fellow couldn't get ten subscribers in this place in a hundred years how do you know i mean to try it anyhow i wouldn't you will just be told to get out and not trouble people that won't hurt me then i will get out and go to the next one i mean to try anyhow there is nothing like trying said mrs browning as she stopped to turn the johnny cake and ben turned and smiled on her and wondered if the prayer he offered had anything to do with this chance he began to try it as soon as his breakfast was eaten and by noon the next day had twenty-four shillings in his pocket a gold sovereign and four shillings of silver mrs simons had been the first one who paid any attention to him ben had thought it strange that she did for she was at the depot waiting for the train he had thought himself foolish for troubling her just then but yet had resolved to try why yes she said smiling i was going to take that book for nettie this year and i might as well take it of you as of any one and she had given him nettie's address on a bit of paper and eight shillings after that a good many refused him then he went to judge morrison's office the judge was a dignified gentleman of whom ben was afraid but he took off his gold glasses and looked kindly on ben and asked a number of questions and said that was a very good idea and he began life something in that way himself and finally said he would give two subscriptions because alice always expected her cousin to get just what she did could ben change a sovereign oh yes ben could so four shillings were given up and a gold sovereign took their place and ben went out believing that he would one day be a judge and wear gold glasses and fill his pockets with gold pieces to help honest boys the fact is ben browning's heart was in a glow all day over that gold piece though not a penny of it belonged to him but the rest of the day was work without reward nobody would even take time to listen to his story of a wonderful magazine never mind he said cheerily twenty-four shillings in one day will do then he stopped short for there was a sign in the window boy wanted was this a chance 
in he went yes it was business was brisk and errand boys were scarce and he was hired only until after the holidays mr jones explained but ben was glad of a little work at small wages before night of the next day he was not sure about being glad trouble came to him in this fashion the door opened hurriedly and mr parnell looked in give me a package of common envelopes large size in a hurry he said and ben sprang to do his bidding he tossed a shilling on the counter studying an open letter while he waited for change and darting out the moment his package was ready in twenty minutes he was back again young man what did i give you to pay for the envelopes you gave me a shilling sir said ben promptly no i didn't i gave you a sovereign now there was a scene mr jones the merchant and mr akers his chief clerk and tommy nelson the errand boy all came over to attend to the matter ben had very little to say he was sure that the man gave him one shilling and he gave him back ten pence and i am sure said mr parnell that i gave you a gold sovereign i had it had just been handed to me and i very carelessly dropped it into this pocket and came in here i have been nowhere else and the gold piece is gone and the only shilling i had is still in my pocket the money drawer was drawn out and searched no gold piece appeared ben said tommy nelson you was a-wishing just this morning for a sovereign are you sure you didn't pocket it tommy meant nothing but mischief but mr parnell turned and looked suspiciously at ben and mr jones who trusted him as fully as he did himself said turn your pockets inside out ben and show us the folly of this why don't you said mr jones impatiently and ben began because i have a sovereign but it isn't mr parnell's oh of course not said that gentleman significantly i suppose sovereigns are plentiful with you ben told the story of this one but he could feel while he was talking that it was not believed well said mr jones it is easy to learn the truth mrs simons doesn't live far from here mrs simons went to town yesterday sir said ben she was at the depot when she gave me the money a likely place in which to subscribe for a magazine said mr parnell tommy said mr jones sharply run around to judge morrison's office and ask him if he will see two or three people for a few minutes on business tommy came back in haste and breathless judge morrison went to town in the ten o'clock train he panted ben bit his lips until they burned and mr parnell laughed the shortest way out of this my boy is to give me that sovereign he said looking steadily at ben i don't want to be hard on you and i can understand how you were suddenly tempted but you will never find it so easy to get back into the right as it is now give me the money and i will forgive you and mr jones will i think and you can redeem your character come in here said mr jones and they three went into the little back room and the door was shut it was of no use be as kind as they could no confession could they get from poor ben he stoutly held to his first story it ended by mr jones commanding him to give up the sovereign and go home and not show his face in the store again and be thankful that he was not arrested for a thief poor ben browning he told the story at home and his father looked paler than ever before and said oh poor boy are you sure you are telling the exact truth father said ben and his face was crimson of course he is said alec hotly and i would have knocked them all down i know he is said the mother gently and ben dear don't feel too badly it is a trial but it will all come out right mrs simons will be home in a few days upstairs in his own room in the dark and the cold 
ben cried as though his heart were broken was this the love and care that his new master was to have for him to be called a thief hark ben and the night following the lord stood by him and said be of good cheer did someone speak the words yes the holy spirit whispered them in ben's ear he had read them only that morning in his bible he told himself then that he should have thought that would have been enough for paul that he could stand anything after that well if enough for paul why not for ben they told lies about paul and he bore it ben rose up from his knees with his face quiet he was glad it was night and that he could go to sleep he was tired but not angry any more he went downstairs and kissed his mother and then went to bed and to sleep he meant to lie awake and think how to earn the money that belonged to mrs simons and to judge morrison but he was too sleepy End of chapter four chapter five a frank apology if any man suffer as a christian let him not be ashamed a conscience void of offence toward god and toward men and he said who art thou lord and he said i am jesus whom thou persecutest having therefore obtained help of god i continue unto this day it was that last verse which held ben browning's eye and heart as he read it over the next morning his room was so cold that there was not much chance for reading he had therefore resolved to snatch at a verse while he combed his hair and see what it had for him it struck him as strange that this verse he snatched should happen to be just that one certainly he had obtained help of god nobody could feel more sure of it than he felt last night when he rose from his knees than he felt this morning for though with the first blink of his eyes the troubles of yesterday flashed into his memory he noticed that the heavy feeling was gone it seemed to him that there would certainly be some way out mrs simmons would be at home in a few days and would prove that part of the story and judge morrison never remained away long at a time and would certainly own to the gold piece but then said ben aloud and thoughtfully even when they do tell their stories they will not prove that i did not take mr parnell's sovereign and hide it all these things go to prove that i was after money he stopped over this thought blowing his fingers to keep them from freezing then beginning to move the brush rapidly again why then i suppose they will have to think so until i can prove that it isn't true anyhow i'm sure of one thing i didn't do it and that ought to be enough for me it was enough for paul he got through and so shall i somehow whereupon he whistled just a little bit breaking off in the midst of a strain he thought it might sound heartless to the people downstairs to all but his mother she would understand well his mother said as he came into the kitchen she was turning cakes on the griddle but she turned to look at him and was evidently relieved when she saw his face was bright well he answered her i continue unto this day having therefore her voice was eager and he saw that she knew the verse yes he said and she only answered oh ben and turned quickly back to her cakes but her face grew bright what are you talking about alec asked he had a book in his hand and was studying help said ben you'll need some before the day is done that little wretch of a tommy nelson has told all over town about yesterday's scrape if i could catch him i'd square him he says that comes he guesses of your turning pious he heard that you had turned pious along with george strong what does he mean by that i don't know said ben and his face flushed a little was he to have trouble about this too if any man suffer as a christian let him not be ashamed who said that 
why it was effie getting her verse ready for morning prayers it was strange how things fitted ben knew that the bible was a wonderful book but it had never seemed to him just like this his face was more flushed still but it was a surprise and a sort of strange delight which flushed it now instead of embarrassment while his father was reading in the bible he found his thoughts wandering away to decide what he should do all day since he was shut out from the store he brought them back sharply with the statement that it was not their business to attend to that question now but when his father prayed to be directed that day to be shown just where to go and what to say and to be helped out of trouble ben's heart said amen and he was glad to be reminded in this way that god knew all about the trouble and the day before prayers were fairly over there was a knock at the door the caller was tommy nelson where's ben he asked oh there you are you are wanted down at the store as fast as your feet can carry you then tommy nelson vanished not waiting for alec to square him though that young person glared at him as though he would like to do so ben waited only to kiss his mother then hurried away he did not want to hear any talk as to what could be wanted of him now early as it was there were several people in the store among them mr parnell ben bowed respectfully and said nothing he felt it was the business of others to speak he was the one who had been sent for well sir began mr parnell what do you suppose we want now i don't know sir answered ben and he looked at the gentleman with clear eyes and a face that said whatever you want i have no need to be afraid of it for i have done nothing wrong mr parnell laughed i guess you don't he said it is rather new business for me i don't often have to make apologies the fact is my boy i made a big mistake yesterday which has cost you all this trouble there's the very sovereign i thought you had in your pocket it seems it was in mine all the time slipped inside the lining somehow i knew i had but one and this morning when i went to put the vest on out it tumbled then i remembered in a flash that i did have a shilling in that pocket too it was given me an hour before and i forgot all about it so now you were right and i was wrong and i ask your pardon for having stolen your sovereign which i now humbly restore to its rightful owner mr parnell had a loud voice there was no fear that all in the store did not hear him distinctly tommy nelson in particular with his mouth open drank in every word ben's cheeks were very red before the speech was through he did not know what to say thank you sir he stammered at last of course i knew i didn't take it but i wanted you to know it just so said mr parnell and he laughed as loudly as he had talked something in the reply seemed to please him wonderfully look here young man he said as soon as he had done laughing i am vexed with this other sovereign it has given me more trouble than gold ever did before i'm going to let it change hands and see if it can behave better it belongs to you now look out for it it is a slippery fellow and he tossed the gleaming thing skillfully into ben's hand which lay palm upward on the counter against which he was resting oh my said tommy nelson then clapped his hands over his open mouth ben tried to stammer thanks again and to give back the sovereign and to protest that he wanted nothing but to have it known that he was an honest boy all right said mr parnell nodding rapidly we all understand that you knew all about it all the time and now the rest of us know but i'll have nothing more to do with that gold piece mind you see if you can make it behave itself and when i want a boy who knows he is honest i'll remember you good-bye and mr parnell opened the store door and vanished ben said his old employer i'm sorry i couldn't seem to believe you yesterday are you ready to go to work yes sir 
said Ben, and to work he went. End of chapter 5chapter six perseverance rewarded i believe god that it shall be even as it was told me then they cried unto the lord in their trouble and he delivered them out of their distresses he thanked god and took courage the salvation of god is sent unto the gentiles one afternoon mrs browning's kitchen table was a sight to behold paper and ink and quads and wedges and indeed all the tools connected with a small printing office were scattered over it alec had been helping and effie had been helping and father had been helping and of course mother was at hand with suggestion and kind word of caution or of sympathy at the proper moment a very important piece of work was being accomplished you are to understand that Ben did at last succeed in getting subscribers enough to get the prize of the printing press. There had, however, been a good deal of delay. One of his letters miscarried, and then the press, when finally sent, went to the wrong town and lay there a few days. And when it arrived, a certain small but very important part had been injured and had to be written about and waited for, and another part sent and studied over and indeed the trials were so great connected with the setting up of that press that more than once ben browning was tempted to wish that he had never heard of it and alec did say often enough to be very trying i told you so then after the press was in complete working order came the business of learning to set type to find the right letters in the first place to distinguish between the p's and q's the n's and u's to stand them so that they did not appear in print on their heads or wrong side before to keep them from pitching forward or backward or a trifle to one side to so arrange them that half the word would not be a blur of ink and the other half too faint to be read no one but a practical printer can begin to imagine the trials that poor ben browning had to undergo if he had not been a persevering sort of a fellow, he would have thrown up the whole business in disgust long before this evening in March in which he was eagerly working. But at last patience and perseverance had been rewarded. Ben could set type with some degree of speed. He knew at a glance which was N and which was U, and just what way the R's ought to run. He had so arranged his wedges that he could lock his frame securely with no fear of pie, and he had a job, his first one, which was to introduce him in town as a skillful printer ready for business. On the first day of April the Temperance Society was to have an ice cream festival in the town hall, the first of its kind for the season. One of the members, knowing of Ben Browning's little printing press, proposed that they give him a job for of course he would not charge so much as the regular printers so a committee was sent to see him and a bargain was made the society was to furnish the paper for two hundred notices and ben browning was to do the work for sixpence certainly they could not have expected anything cheaper and as this was the first money ben's press would earn he was eager and glad over it so were the whole family alec worked faithfully though he indulged himself in telling ben that he was a regular duffer for doing such a cheap job it was worth every penny when ben was ready for bed that night the notices were not only printed but affixed to every available fence and post and tree and block the first word was notice in the largest type that ben had which to tell the truth was not very large and the committee from the society had objected at first that the size would not do at all but they finally decided to try it then followed an account of all the good things which would be served to those who would visit the town hall on the evening of april first the boys came in from placarding the town with faces bright george strong had been with them all the evening helping and he was sure it would give satisfaction ben looked over effie's calendar cards 
and told his mother that he would take that verse for a week that verse was he thanked god and took courage then ben went to bed and dreamed that he had made his fortune alas for dreams and for courage this is a wicked world and among the mean things in it are sometimes boys and the next morning was the special day for fools and they were up early and at work when ben browning saw the chairman of the temperance society committee coming and went to the door to receive his expected thanks and sixpence he met an enraged young man who could not talk fast enough to do justice to the subject it was some time before ben could understand what he meant in fact he had to go out and stand at the street corner and stare sadly at the post before he took in the fullness of the trouble no ice these were the words which greeted his astonished eyes and the letters with that ominous space between which he had not made looked somehow much larger than they had when he worked over them all over town the enterprising seekers after mischief had gone and with care and skill worthy of a better object had cut out the letter t from every notice in the lot an ice cream festival was something which had not been thought of before that season and now behold all that the notice told the hurrying passers-by was that the ice had given out and therefore of course no ice cream could be expected loud was the wrath of the temperance society in vain poor ben attempted certain bewildered explanations they persisted in thinking that it was his own miserable little joke on them and went away shaking their heads and assuring him that he would pay for this shall you have to get a new verse asked his mother as he stood looking doubtfully out of the window uncertain which way to turn she said it wistfully and in a sympathetic tone he turned to her and smiled as he said seems to me i shall i don't feel very courageous give me one mother then they cried unto the lord in their trouble and he delivered them out of their distresses ben gave a little start and said but mother this is such a little trouble for him to attend to is it little to you ben no it feels large it will just about spoil all my hopes for getting any work to do with my press do you think it seems small to your mother no mother i know you care then he smiled and i see what you mean after that he went up to his room the story of the festival and of no ice spread through the town of course among others who read the notice and inquired about it was mr parnell it is all owing to that rascally gold piece he said i knew it couldn't behave itself then he went to the printing office two hours afterwards he came to call on ben the mournful story was told and ben being questioned as to what was to be done next admitted that he did not know oh yes he could print more and would gladly do so the type was distributed but it would not take long to set it up but he had no paper and when he offered to make a hundred more if the committee would advance the paper they told him that they had had enough of his printing if father had any money to spare said ben he would have given me some to get paper with but he has none at all this morning then mr parnell unrolled a package which he carried in his hand what do you think of these he asked blue green pink white gray paper in squares the size of ben's form another package heavier than paper it was type large letters loud ones not many but enough to print a few telling words such as ben had longed to have in his notice this paper and this type belong to you that is i borrowed this particular alphabet from the printing office but they sent out an order for me to have some like it sent to you by tomorrow. the truth is i shall want some printing done which will need this kind of type so i sent for it i shall lend it to you as long as you need it why the fact is i'm trying to get ahead of that gold piece 
i was afraid it would serve you a mean trick you should have seen how the notices flew about the town that afternoon temperance society in large letters then come to the town hall tonight then in large type again ice cream the town hall was thronged never had a festival been better advertised never was so much ice cream sold in one evening ben went and took his sister there came two tickets for him just at dusk from one of the committee and before nine o'clock another member of it came with smiling face and paid him four shillings for the notices which were so neatly got up and so thoroughly scattered assuring him that he would have all their work in future at half past nine ben browning proudly dropped the money into his father's hand then as he kissed his mother he whispered i cried and he brought me out end of chapter six chapter seven the power of conscience children obey your parents in the lord for this is right let this mind be in you which was also in christ jesus the god of peace shall be with you this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that christ jesus came into the world to save sinners the holy scriptures which are able to make thee wise unto salvation it really did seem at last as though good times had come again to the brownings at least better times than they had been having mr browning's cough grew better as the spring set in and he began to talk cheerily about being quite well when the long summer days came alec and ben had both joined the evening school the proceeds from the printing press having furnished the money that printing press had been a success from the first effort ben was astonished to discover how much work there was found to do on it cards and circulars and handbills and church notices of one sort and another seemed to be wanted all the time orders poured in upon him so constantly that alec had long since been taken in as a partner and the proceeds were equally divided ben generously refusing to let alec share half the expense of the first beginning because as he said the beginning was a sort of happen in about five minutes he changed that sentence i don't mean any such thing alec nothing ever happened less than that whole thing did if it wasn't planned then nothing is planned who planned it god did ben's voice was very reverent alec made a queer little sound it was not a laugh and it certainly was not a sneer and yet it sounded a trifle like both i wonder if you are so foolish as to suppose that god thinks about all such little affairs as that i thought you had more sense ben worked away at the paper he was cutting into squares ready for his press and said nothing for several minutes at last he spoke with great quietness alec there are some things that a fellow knows because he has read them or heard other people in whom he believes tell them and then there are some things that he knows because he has felt them and it is very hard to cheat him about such things now i know that what i am talking about is so because i have felt it i didn't expect you to understand how it could be and you won't until you try it for yourself when you do that you will be as sure as i am and you will remember what i told you to this alec had no reply it certainly seemed reasonable mrs browning too felt much more cheery than she had in the early winter it was not because her work was easier the truth is she had found some new work mrs strong asked her one night if she happened to know of anybody who was a good ironer every week she had more and more shirts to iron and it would grow worse as the weather grew warmer and she hated to part with any of her regular customers and so she thought if she could find anybody who would do it she would get help for a while why yes said mrs browning stopping in the midst of the long seam she was sewing i do i know myself 
and henry thinks there never was anybody who could iron a shirt better than i though i suppose all husbands think that way oh but of course i wasn't thinking of such a thing as you're doing it mrs browning and mrs strong's face grew red and she knitted very fast but i was said mrs browning now that is an idea i have turned that question over and over for a week wondering how i could bring in a little money for some things that are needed this spring ben would say the lord put it into your heart to ask that question mrs strong that plan worked nicely there were only two people who did not thoroughly like it mr browning was disposed to think that his wife had quite as much as she ought to do without ironing other people's shirts and alec was disgusted it wasn't the ironing nor the fact that the shirts belonged to other people which troubled him but the thought that george strong's mother furnished the work he could not help feeling that it was humiliating to be depending for help on a woman whom his mother had done so much for a little while ago but this thought troubled nobody but alec it was a lovely may morning that ben counted the money in his iron bank a little box of his childhood that had long been empty but now was growing very useful thirteen and sixpence he said to alec who was waiting for him if we get a job of some sort to-day and it pays us well we shall each have a pound by night and then say i for shoes and hats for sunday there won't be likely to be a job to-day alec said i don't know a thing that calls for printing something has popped up in somebody's brain through the night maybe anyhow let us keep our eyes wide open at the corner the two boys separated alec had an errand to do for his father and ben was on his way to buy starch for his mother keeping his eyes open he saw mr simons in his door beckoning to him ben took long strides and reached the door looking for work young man yes sir said ben smiling could you furnish printing and errand boy yes sir ben's answer was as prompt and his face as bright as before this sounded like a good job well i have a prime article that i want to have advertised pretty generally you may get me up say about five hundred bills in your best style and if you circulate them through the town thoroughly in the places where i want them i will pay you four shillings for your job the printed matter is very short only a sentence all right sir i'll do it said ben he could afford to smile broadly now only a sentence why he and alec could have the work done in a couple of hours and be ready for the next job shoes and hats for next sunday sure here's your copy said mr simons report to me when the work is done and your money shall be ready and ben took the sheet of paper and said thank you sir and walked away reading call at simon's corner store and try his fresh lager splendid quality just the thing for a spring tonic this was the sentence ben read it carefully moving slowly slower still finally he stopped his whole face falling into shadow what was the matter with the sentence or two father he said suddenly as he saw his father step from a hardware store just ahead of him father wait a minute and he hastened to overtake him what do you think of that mr browning read the sentence something that he wants printed eh well drinking beer is poor business according to my way of thinking but we can't help it i suppose if folks will drink the stuff why they will but father ought i to help them along by printing the bills why as to that somebody will print them quick enough if you don't you might as well have the pay as anybody then you think i ought to do it why i don't say that and yet i don't know but you ought you need the money and you are not to blame because mr simon sells beer or advertises it he will sell as much to a glass probably whether you do his work for him or not 
by this time mr browning had reached the shop where he worked and ben went on alone very slowly a thoughtful perplexed look on his face things seemed to him very much muddled at the gate he met alec for which he was sorry he was not ready to see him just yet any work asked alec i didn't get a thing i knew this was going to be a bad day what is that halloo so you did get a job good for you not a very long one either we can work that off in less than no time i wish i were sure of that don't you ever feel afraid of starting things that don't work off very easy who wants to advertise their old beer well of course as to that we can't help their drinking the stuff if they will be fools we might as well have the pay as anybody his father's argument expressed in a little rougher language yet ben was not satisfied what would mother say he went in to her showing the paper alec went at once to the box and began to get out the printing materials mrs browning read the sentence looked at ben with a meaning smile on her face that he did not understand and ironed away well mother well ben is it all right mother father thinks it is or that is he says we can't help it if folks will sell beer and drink it we are not to blame do you feel so too do you my boy ben wriggled a little and drew the ironing cloth out of place i don't know what i think we need the money and it won't make any difference who prints it i suppose it will get printed all the same if that little boy passing the window were to be shot to-day and you and i knew it would it make any difference with you and me whether you shot him or whether somebody else did that's a fact said ben it seemed a curious way to answer a question yet apparently his mother understood i'm most sure father thinks i ought to do it he says i need the money this was ben's next remark his mother's reply if it could be called a reply was to ask if the verses said anything about it ben laughed the idea of effie's calendar cards having anything about his business troubles seemed queer however he went presently and took down the card for the month and read the first verse carefully children obey your parents in the lord it was the last three words over which he stopped with a thoughtful face he had never seemed to notice them before then even if his father thought he ought to do a thing it didn't settle it unless the lord thought so too but was it likely that his father would make a mistake ben did not like to think so he read on perhaps the card spoke more plainly let this mind be in you which was also in christ jesus that was the next sentence his face flushed as he read then he must act as he thought jesus would have done would he have printed and handed all over town an invitation to men and boys to go and drink lager beer when his own book spoke so plainly against the sin of drunkenness and lager beer helped to make drunkards ben hung up the card and went in search of alec we can't do it he said speaking quickly why not asked alec stopping in the act of taking out a quantity of quads has he changed his mind already no but we must alec it isn't right i know it isn't i've been afraid of it all the time now i'm sure fiddlesticks said alec quite shortly you are getting too good to live in this world i wonder what's the harm nobody will drink a drop more or less of the stuff because we print it just as though he couldn't go around to the printing office and get it printed in ten minutes he only does it to help us along ben i know all that but we mustn't do it it is wrong i must go and tell mr simons that i have made a mistake he will think you are a first-class idiot and that is all you will accomplish all right said ben smiling a fellow may better be an idiot than a scamp it is breaking my pledge to touch the thing and i mustn't do it 
i wonder i didn't see it right away how came you to see it now ben hesitated and his cheeks grew red aleck would not understand at last he spoke i saw my orders for the day hung up in the sitting-room and they go right against this business your orders for the day what do you mean what were they let this mind be in you which was also in christ jesus there is no use in talking aleck i know he wouldn't have printed those bills stuff and nonsense said aleck and he left the quads and type in confusion and stalked away End of chapter 7chapter eight important questions how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto god by him seeing he ever liveth to maketh intercession for them but grow in grace and in the knowledge of our lord and saviour jesus christ the Browning family were gathered in the little summer sitting-room, spending the June evening together. They were busy, of course. Mrs. Browning had her mending. There never seemed to be any end to the mending for those two boys and their father. Mr. Browning used sometimes to say that his wife had never seen the bottom of her basket. The boys were busy with their books, and Effie had her crochet work. As for Mr. Browning, he had the weekly paper which his next neighbor had lent him and was reading bits of news from it for the benefit of his wife and effie occasionally saying i must keep still so the boys can work whereupon both boys would assure him that their work was getting on nicely and he need not stop for them suddenly mr browning uttered an exclamation i declare that was dreadful what is it asked mother and effie in the same breath while the boys looked up from their books so he read the article again it was the account of a boy who had gone out in a rowboat with his little sister they had rowed toward shore at last as the tide was rising and the boy had been forbidden to try and row against it sitting there in the boat the little sister playing with the lilies she had gathered the boy idly turning the leaves of a book intending every moment to fasten the boat but neglecting to do it he paid no attention to the fact that presently the boat began to drift farther and farther from the shore until at last his little sister exclaimed look harry look and behold they were out to sea the oars lying on the bank and the swift flowing tide carrying them on with no one in sight to help them the story went on to tell how the boy and girl were missed and searched for and called after and no answer came and nothing was known of them for days and days when it was discovered that they had been picked up by a passing steamer the boy almost dead with fright and the little girl in a burning fever so much for meaning to do a thing and neglecting it for a few minutes said mr browning the boys had been listening and ben spoke his thoughts it was natural enough wasn't it father he had no idea i suppose that harm could come in so short a time and he meant to fasten the boat before there was the least danger aleck spoke sharply he had no business to try it any boy who would risk his life and his sister's life in that way ought to suffer the idea of neglecting such a thing as that when there was a possibility of there being any danger still ever so many people do it ben spoke thoughtfully with a little touch of sadness in his voice but aleck answered with eagerness and a little bit of scorn not honest people ben or honorable people i don't think a boy who respected himself would do such a silly thing if i had been that fellow and had to say to my father and mother that i meant to take good care of my sister and just neglected it for a few minutes i'm afraid i should have almost wanted to drown to save myself the shame of having to make such a confession i know i should not expect to be trusted again in a hurry effie had left her crocheting and slipped around to her brother's side 
and now she wound her arm caressingly around his neck as she said you would not have taken care of me in that way would you and he returned the caress with a kiss and declared that he just wouldn't and neither would any other fellow who thought anything of himself he should like to see ben doing such a thing for all he said it was natural no ben said after a thoughtful silence he didn't believe he should and yet it was queer how people did neglect things of even more importance than that more important than taking care of one's little sister said alec his voice expressing astonishment and a little disgust i don't know about a fellow having a much more important duty to attend to than that ben said no more but went back to his lesson and the next interruption was a call from the mother to lay aside work because it was time for prayers then came the verses and when effie recited hers ben looked with a quick meaning glance at his brother effie's voice was clear and sweet how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation when the boys were in their own room ben spoke the thought in his heart alec old fellow i didn't like to say it before the folks but i know something which lots of people neglect and which is more important than taking care of anybody out with it then it must be you think i am caught in the trap with the lots of people what are you driving at didn't you notice effie's verse tonight alec was silent for a few minutes then he said that is something which i don't know anything about ah but what difference does that make suppose that boy had not known anything about the tide would that have hindered him from being almost drowned it would have made him less to blame i don't know about that if he had heard that there was danger and had simply said i don't know anything about it and then had gone in just as though he had not heard would not he have been to blame this question alec did not choose to answer at last he said i don't pretend to know what you mean when you talk about such things i don't much believe there is any such thing as you tell about a fellow being changed in a minute's time so that he wants to do things that he didn't before and all that sort of talk ben did not exactly laugh in fact the sound which he made ended in a little sigh but he said do you know that reminds me of old blind pete you never heard anybody go on as he did this morning he said he didn't know about all those colors that people named over red and green and blue and all those he had felt them and smelled them and he couldn't see any difference sometimes he thought that people just imagined the difference alec couldn't help laughing at this old pete was a character whose business was to amuse everybody with his queer ideas presently ben said look here alec i want to ask you four questions may i fire away said alec pitching one of his boots halfway across the room and sitting down on the side of the bed to pull off the other do you believe there is such a place as heaven where folks can go when they die if they choose to of course i do i'm not a heathen if i don't pretend to be as good as some other people well do you believe that the bible knows all about it and has planned the road for folks to travel i suppose so and do you believe that there might be such a thing as not getting there if you should neglect it long enough that verse you are talking about says so and do you think it is sensible to try it i think it is bedtime said alec springing up from his seat on the bed and beginning to scurry around the room that's all i wanted to ask ben said and he too began to get ready for bed end of chapter eight chapter nine divine guidance he that walketh with wise men shall be wise but a companion of fools shall be destroyed thou shalt have no other gods before me the way of the wicked is an abomination unto the lord 
so he went and did according unto the word of the lord it was out on an old bench under an old tree that they talked it over alec looked what the boys call glum i thought you were ready for the whole thing he said i'm sure you said nothing against it the last time i talked with you no said ben that's a fact i didn't think of the harm then there isn't any harm i don't believe it is just one of your queer notions slipping out of bed on a summer night at midnight for the sake of having a little fun who's hurt i wonder then why don't they tell their fathers and mothers because half the fun would be gone right away it is to surprise them that the whole thing is done they don't expect the bells to ring and it will be just jolly fun to have them commence all of a sudden and to have the crackers and things all go off at once and the bonfires and everything i wouldn't miss it for a good deal do you mean to go alec alec kicked the dust right and left with his foot and looked across for a full minute before he answered it seemed to provoke him to think he should have to say what he did i won't go without you you know that well enough but i must say i think it is mean in you to spoil a fellow's fun just for nothing you don't know what all this is about i can tell you it is a simple enough story for reasons best known to themselves the grown people of the town where the brownings lived had decreed that the bells should not be rung at midnight on the eve of independence day many fathers and mothers rejoiced over this but the boys groaned and believed it was a cruel infringement on customs which had lasted ever since their own grandfathers were children a few of them as the time drew near did more than groan they put their wise young heads together and made up a plan to astonish the fathers and mothers and set every bell in town to ringing on the same instant not only this but a cannon on the green was to be fired and a huge bonfire lighted and the number of firecrackers which were to be sent off between the hours of twelve and one i could not begin to count to this bit of fun which was to be kept secret from all old heads the browning boys had been bidden and had accepted with glee at first and now here was ben changing his mind to alec's great disgust how had it happened that was just what alec wanted to know and after giving the dust another kick or two with his foot he said i should like to know what has turned you around so suddenly ben hesitated then laughed a little it was something mr saunders said that had a good deal to do with it i suppose mr saunders what does he know about it nothing at all he talked about it without knowing it you see alec it was this way after we left the boys the other night you know and you went to the post office and i went after matches i walked up street behind mr saunders and george morrison they were walking slowly and i couldn't pass them very well at least i didn't think it would be polite when i knew they would turn at the corner i could hear what they were saying as well as though i had been with them they were talking about some folks whom i never heard of and just as they reached the corner mr saunders said well now you mark my words it is a good rule and seldom fails the boy who will do anything i don't care how small unknown to his parents provided he has respectable parents whom he has reason to believe in hasn't a very high sense of honor and will never amount to much unless he changes his course stuff and nonsense said alec angrily just as if such talk applied to this nothing but a little fun at that rate we could never surprise them with presents nor anything oh now alec you know that isn't quite the thing to say it is all well enough to call it fun and i don't suppose the boys mean anything else but after all don't you honestly believe that if you and i should tell father and ask his permission to slip out at midnight and help in the fun he would say no quicker than a wink to this question alec made no reply and ben went on after a moment's embarrassed pause and another little laugh that isn't the whole of it either 
it struck me as rather queer that mr saunders's words should fit in so with our plans or fit in against them rather when he didn't know a thing about it and i kept thinking it over all the way home i got home first you know and the first thing mother told me to do was to hand her the calendar till she could find the place for effie in the bible as i carried it i read this verse he that walketh with wise men shall be wise but a companion of fools shall be destroyed well i hadn't been walking with mr saunders exactly but i had been walking behind him and listening to what he said and you know there isn't a greater dunce in this town than archie reader who is getting up this thing i shouldn't like to call him a fool but he comes precious near it so far as lessons are concerned and putting the whole thing together it made me feel queer i thought it all over and the long and short of it is i don't believe it is the right thing to do and i say old fellow don't let's do it we can have lots of fun that father and mother will like without going into what we know they wouldn't i thought there was some bible mixed up with it in some way said alec discontentedly but he spoke with the air of a boy who was giving up his plans ben's face brightened then the two boys went away now it happened that just back of the old tree was a high board fence and just the other side the fence were nelly and edith roberts one perched in the lower limb of the apple tree swinging her slippered feet and the other on the ground beside her hands clasped around a branch of the tree the faces of both little girls showed that they were studying a question though they had not spoken a word since the boys on the other side began to talk they were two little city sisters who had come to spend the months of july and august with aunt helen in the country they had a plan for independence day it was not to slip out at midnight and ring bells and firecrackers it was to go with a party of boys and girls to the bit of an island that lay in the midst of crystal lake and have a picnic well what was there about that to make them look sober why nothing only both the little girls knew as well as they knew anything in the world that their mother had a terror of the water and would on no account allow them to go rowing they could hear her voice now speaking to papa by the way ellis there is no lake or river in that part of the country is there not a mill pond said papa decidedly and the mother's anxious face grew content but father had not been in that part of the country for years and he had forgotten all about the pretty little pond four miles from town that now was beautified along its banks and had several rowboats on it and was called crystal lake so the little girls had no orders about crystal lake and aunt helen was going and other grown people and they had said to each other only two hours before that it would be just too silly for anything for them not to go just because they knew mamma was afraid of the water yet they looked thoughtful now and were silent at last nelly from her perch among the apples spoke her mind edith roberts i do truly believe we ought not to go a step and said edith so do i don't let us but the boys knew nothing of this in the morning they came downstairs early they had lain awake the night before listening to the noise so had their mother and she had a headache in consequence somehow the noise did not seem half so interesting to the boys lying in bed listening to it as they had supposed it would they were prepared for their father's grave face but not for his news he had been at the gate talking with a neighbor i am afraid that serious mischief will grow out of last night's uproar he began mr snyder says the bells awoke poor mrs kelland from the first sleep she had had in two days and she went right into spasms again and there is very little hope that she will live the day out the boys and their mother exclaimed in dismay and mrs browning said why didn't they see to it beforehand that the bell should not ring they live so near the largest bell i should have supposed they would think of it why they did think of it and were assured that measures had been taken to keep everything quiet 
it seems there were three or four pretty sick people that they were afraid would be injured but the boys planned a rush on all the bells at once and contrived the thing so cunningly that it was some time before they could be stopped i hope they all feel happy this morning over the misery they have caused were your boys in it mr wells asked no sir i told him my boys were where they ought to have been in bed and i was thankful to be able to say so i can assure you his two boys exchanged significant glances half an hour afterwards alec said as he passed ben his bible for family prayers look up another verse old fellow we may as well live by it it has kept us out of this scrape it was a week afterwards that edith and nelly roberts displayed with utmost delight two exquisite fans with ivory handles around which bits of paper were twisted which read for two good girls who remembered their mother and gave up their pleasure for her sake we ought to show these fans to the boys who kept us from going said nelly why they don't know anything about it and never will said edith then both girls giggled end of chapter nine chapter ten a bad bargain you have forsaken the commandments of the lord and thou hast followed balaam if the lord be god follow him but if baal then follow him the lord he is the god the lord he is the god and after the fire a still small voice thou hast sold thyself to work evil in the sight of the lord mrs eastman stood in the back doorway and alec browning cap in hand stood waiting respectfully for her to finish her sentence you see she was saying i am more particular about sunday than any other time in the week we ought to be you know seeing it as the best day mr eastman is at home then and henry and neither of them gets very good dinners on other days so if i can get my berries and peas fresh and nice i am willing to pay a better price for them the ones we get from the carts on saturdays seem worse than any we have through the week they gather up all sorts i suppose for sunday trade well we'll consider it a bargain shall we a penny more on a court than you can get anywhere else and they are to be picked fresh every sunday morning it won't take more than an hour these long mornings and you live so near the garden you can slip in and out you and ben without being noticed two things in that last sentence to consider in the first place why should he care about slipping into places without being noticed he had not been in the habit of thinking whether he was noticed or not then that phrase you and ben he had not thought of ben helping now that he did think about it he knew that ben wouldn't but why not suppose it was sunday didn't folks have to eat on sunday yes but a good many people managed to get along without buying things to eat his mother he knew would never allow the milkman's bell to be rung at their gate on sunday and milk was more important than berries and peas but what harm was there in going quietly into mr harper's garden on sunday morning and picking a couple of quarts of berries for mrs eastman when she wanted them so badly and was willing to pay a good price as for the peas they grew in their own garden he could think over his sabbath school lesson while he picked well for the matter of that why didn't his mother get out mrs eastman's calico dress she was making and sew on it she could think about the sermon while she sewed thou hast sold thyself to work evil in the sight of the lord who said that alec looked about him almost expecting to see some one whether it was his own reference to thinking over the sabbath school lesson while he picked sabbath berries or whatever it was that verse came and stood out before him and insisted on being thought about he walked for a long distance without speaking if it is so i have sold myself cheap a penny on a court 
this he said aloud after walking the entire length of the street it was saturday morning and when he first heard mrs eastman's offer he had expected to be happy all day over the added penny but when he looked it all over at night he thought it the most uncomfortable day he had spent in a long while sold he alec browning who prided himself on his honesty and industry and manliness generally sold to do evil he could not believe it possible he would not for a long time own that it was evil but that sentence about slipping in and out without being noticed seemed to hover around him finally he told himself to say frankly whether he was willing to be noticed suppose the minister should come through the woods while he was picking the berries suppose his sabbath school teacher should come along just as he was delivering four quarts of peas at mrs eastman's back door thou hast sold thyself to work evil in the sight of the lord there came that verse again at the most critical moment what was the minister's sight or the teacher's sight compared with the lord's aleck ate very little dinner and especially he would not touch peas his mother was worried and when at tea-time he refused blackberries she looked really distressed and questioned as to whether his head ached or his back no his conscience ached but this he did not say this however he did within an hour after tea he walked with quick step and uplifted head to mrs eastman's back door and in plain courteous language made that lady understand that he must repent of his bargain he had decided that it would not be right to sell goods on sunday she was just a trifle vexed she told aleck that it seemed to her that his goodness had come late in the day this was so undoubtedly true that there was nothing to answer with but blushes then she said that it was most unfortunate for her that he had promised in the morning for now she had lost her chances for sunday supplies to this aleck returned eager answer that he would pick the peas and berries at once and bring them to her just at dusk when the evening dew fresh on them they would keep his mother thought almost as well as though picked in the morning but mrs eastman would have none of this so it was with a somewhat sorrowful heart that aleck turned away still his conscience felt light and glad no more hints that he had sold himself troubled his heart yet he walked on and on scarcely noticing where he went until suddenly he stopped short and said aloud well why not another bible verse had kept him company during the walk if the lord be god follow him a familiar verse he had heard effie repeat it many times during the last few weeks it was not strange that he should remember it but it did seem strange that he should never have thought seriously about the direction in it until this evening now here was a question to answer why not follow him why not begin now he knew he meant to be a servant of the lord some time why not settle the matter at once he must have stood there for several minutes then he turned around and walked toward home slowly it was time he was getting home but he was not ready to reach there yet something was being decided what if he should decide the wrong way at last just as a new star shot into the sky or at least appeared in sight he quickened his steps and they became firm steps which meant decision so did his voice as he spoke aloud again to the listening stars no to the angels who were waiting to carry the news to heaven i mean to do it end of chapter 10"'Chapter Eleven: The Broken Pitcher "'And Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. "'I am the resurrection and the life. "'Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow.' "'Effie Browning did not often have a chance to go barefoot, "'for, though a plump-looking little maiden, "'she very frequently caught cold. 
so though her feet fairly longed for the soft cool grass she generally had to be content with imagining how it would feel but on this particular morning she begged so hard and it was so warm that mrs browning decided it would be ridiculous not to gratify the child it was the bare feet which took her through the meadow instead of the lane and which tempted her to linger so long playing with the dandelion blooms when she went to the spring for water she had her little work apron tied about her waist and it had been her intention to hurry back to wipe the baking dishes for her busy mother but she loitered how she came to take just that particular pitcher to the spring i hardly know it had been a birthday present to alec years before and he was very careful of it effie had not been in so many words forbidden to take it to the spring for water yet i suppose the child knew better if she had thought certainly the bare feet must be blamed for the fact that when the little maiden was at last ready to move on instead of lifting her feet as shoes would certainly have done she shuffled through the pretty grass her eyes still on the dandelion her lips puffed out to blow the downy thing whither it would she shuffled them against the pitcher and it rolled over and knocked its nose against a stone so small that you would not have thought a nose could have found it but it did and it broke itself as noses to pitchers will if they get ever so small a chance then effie hurried home very sober-faced neither dandelions nor grasses caught her again her deeply sorrowful face ought to have calmed alec's displeasure when at noon he found out his loss i think he would have been less vexed if things had gone right with him that morning but it had been one of the days when none of his carefully laid plans worked well and the last thing he had done with his form had been to tip it over just as he was ready to lock it and of course the carefully set up type rolled about in wild glee and made pie for him in short he was just ready to have no patience with effie you are a naughty little girl he said in a more angry tone than alec often used i think you ought to be whipped oh alec said the sorrowful little voice i did not mean to break it that is no excuse of course i know you did not do it on purpose but you ought not to have touched my pitcher a tin pail is the thing to take to the spring you are always meddling with what you have no right to touch i wish i had a cupboard where i could lock up my things from your fingers i am so sorry murmured the sad little voice oh yes i suppose that will put the nose back on my pitcher the only thing i ever had given to me almost and i have kept it ever since i was seven years old and now you must needs go and break it i declare i think you ought to be punished then alec went out and banged the door then effie cried i think she may have felt the hard words all the more because alec rarely spoke in that way and was generally patient even with her meddlesome fingers down she went on the foot of her mother's bed face forward and cried until at last she reached the point where it seemed to her she could not stop crying come said mrs browning thinking it was quite time for her to interfere there is reason in all things you have cried enough see if it teaches you a lesson not to take the boy's things though alec need not have been so cross about an accident this last she spoke low not thinking it wise for the little girl to hear effie rose slowly put on your bonnet and take this basket down to the corner of mr jacob's lane so that he will see it when he comes by with his cows effie arose slowly and went out into the cool air a brisk breeze was blowing and it fanned her hot cheeks and cooled her blood cooled it a little too fast indeed though effie did not think of that until she actually began to shiver then she made haste home i'm hot and i'm cold both at once she said to her mother and my head aches and i feel little shivers all over me and queer little aches 
mrs browning who knew just what queer little aches and shivers meant to effie set down her flat iron at once and hurried the child unceremoniously into a warm bath and then to bed so the brownings ate supper without her and the mother said with grave face that she was sleeping but tossed about and was feverish before morning alec took a brisk run through the meadow and across the fields for the doctor and the fever which had begun with little shivers raged fiercely and effie's hoarse breathing could be heard distinctly all over the little house oh the misery of the days that followed the one most to be pitied was alec mrs browning was busy every minute trying to do something for the relief of her little girl mr browning when not hard at work earning for her was bending over her lifting her in his arms or soothing and helping as best he could but poor alec wandered about like one distraught go where he would do what he would it seemed to him he could hear again his harsh voice saying you are always meddling with what you have no right to touch would she ever meddle again i wish i had a cupboard where i could lock up my things from your fingers poor alec it looked as though no cupboard would be necessary every time the doctor came he looked graver and at last he said i am afraid brother browning that you ought to prepare yourself for the worst alec heard him crouching as he was in a heap on the back door steps waiting for what the doctor would say then it seemed to the boy as though he must die too how could he ever live with that sweet mournful voice sounding in his ears saying i am so sorry and always remember that his last words to her had been words of anger i think you ought to be punished he went up to his room and locked the door when ben came knocking he answered i can't let you in now leave me alone a little while won't you yes said ben mournfully only alec i wanted to tell you that she just roused up and looked at mother and smiled and said over that verse which she was studying that last day i am the resurrection and the life then ben's voice broke into a sob and he ran away the verse stayed with alec set itself over and over in his brain god held life and death in his power he could cure effie even now though the doctor had given her up alec had been so angry and ashamed to think that his outburst to effie and his miserable day generally had followed so fast on his resolve to be a soldier for christ that he had almost been ashamed to pray except in the formal words which had been the habit of his childhood now it seemed to him as though this were a message from effie asking them to pray for her he dropped on his knees beside the bed and cried out another verse which his memory brought to him just then wash me and i shall be whiter than snow o oh god i am a great sinner but i ask thee to wash me and make me white in thy sight and oh spare effie to us thou canst cure her for thou art the resurrection and the life give her life back again to us and let me show her how sorry i am o oh god don't take her to heaven yet for jesus sake over and over and over again the same thought was repeated until at last alec arose feeling more quiet than he had since effie was taken ill it was late nearly eleven o'clock he stole out softly and listened at his mother's door ben was curled in a little heap on the old lounge do you hear anything he asked raising himself as alec stood listening yes alec heard this she breathes more quietly yes and her skin seems to be a trifle moist alec turned away and came and knelt down by ben yes he said huskily i heard father say that her breathing was not so bad oh ben get down here and help me to pray he says he is the resurrection and the life it would be just as easy for him to raise her even though the doctor can't 
and i feel as though she must not die ben because i was so unkind to her that last time she could talk ben let us ask god to raise her up and i will try all my life to show him how glad and thankful i am in the early morning the boys who had curled together on that lounge and slept and listened and prayed and slept again awoke to let in the doctor well poor fellows he said as he saw their worn faces how have you got through the night they keep real still in there said ben and we don't know what to think the fact was that mrs browning had stolen out about three o'clock and thrown a shawl over the sleeping boys but they had not heard her the doctor went on into the closed room the boys looked at each other then they took hold of hands and went softly to the door they must hear what was said they heard distinctly what is all this why the pulse is almost natural why there has been a remarkable change here during the night then the listeners outside put their arms around each other's neck and actually kissed one another a thing they had been too old to do for several years it was a happy home that day once during the day alec went away alone to thank god for his power and his loving kindness and to ask him to keep his lips from ever saying another word to effie that he should regret if she lay dying End of chapter 11chapter twelve the answered prayer fear not for they that be with us are more than they that be with them the things which are impossible with men are possible with god i was glad when they said unto me let us go into the house of the lord mrs browning went about all day with a sorrowful face and two or three times when she came out of her little bedroom her eyes were red the boys were troubled mother had not looked that way even during effie's sickness the fact is that then she had not had time to cry she had just hung over effie and planned and worked for her comfort day and night effie was quite well again and was flitting through the house as gay as a bird and mother had much ado to keep back the tears sometimes before her this both alec and ben saw and thought over for some time before they went out to the woodpile and sat down one on a log the other on a sawhorse and talked it over clearly something was the matter it did not seem as though it could be money this time for father was at work pretty steadily and it was astonishing how much that printing press and the garden and the store work that ben was doing amounted to to be sure there was the doctor's bill for effie's sickness but the boys had themselves heard the doctor say don't let that trouble you mr browning some time when you can pay me as well as not you may do so or you may pay me a little at a time and be a year about it if you want to the boys knew their father would pay just as fast as he could but he had looked grateful and thanked the doctor and spoken more than once of his kindness that did not seem to be a thing for mother to cry over the decision from the woodpile was that mother must be asked the very next chance they had alone with her the next evening after tea came the chance effie was playing croquet in the next neighbor's garden and mr browning sat on the piazza planning an addition to the neighbor's house mrs browning was mending alec's coat and he in his shirt sleeves leaned his elbows on the stand and inquired in the name of ben and himself what was the matter at first the mother tried to evade the question how did they know that anything was the matter what observing boys they must be they mustn't watch mother so closely and find out her secret then it was nothing that they could help and it was no use to worry them still since they insisted she did not know but they might as well understand perhaps they would all know too soon didn't they watch father too didn't they notice how he was coughing again this autumn beginning earlier than last year 
no really the boys busy with their mother and seeing little of father had not noticed well the mother said with a heavy sigh such was the case and there were reasons why it was a more serious thing for him to be coughing now than it was last winter the doctor knew it was serious and had told him so and that was one reason why the doctor had been so very kind about the bill he knew there were more bills in store for them only a few days ago she had coaxed and coaxed father until at last he had had a long talk with the doctor and had been told here the mother stopped her eyes full of tears and her lips quivering so that for a minute she could not speak told what asked both boys at once pressing forward in their eagerness and anxiety sorry for their mother but oh they must hear right away what this was that father had been told so she struggled with her tears and began again told that his lungs were a good deal affected and that he could not hope to get well in this climate if he could go to the south and stay all winter long until the mild june days come again perhaps he might get well but here with the hard winter before him and with the necessity of being exposed to it the thing was impossible and your father says he might as well have been told that he must go to the moon as to the south for the one is not more impossible than the other and here mrs browning gave up to her tears for a few minutes only a very few for mr browning warned by the gathering darkness ended his talk on his neighbor's piazza suddenly and came in coughing the boys looked at him with wide open critical eyes and wondered how it had been possible for them not to notice that he was growing thin and pale here truly was something to think and talk about they said little more to their mother except to learn that the doctor had said that the west was as good a place as any in the south better on some accounts than any other that he knew of and that the journey was a long and expensive one and that it would cost a good deal to live and a stranger could not hope to get work and in short it was utterly impossible for father to go the boys had no answer to make to this for certainly it looked as impossible as anything could they had much talk together out by the woodpile or when husking corn they calculated all the money that they might hope to earn during the winter and wondered if somebody wouldn't advance it but when they found that they could not earn enough to pay for the fare to the south they sighed and abandoned that plan it was one evening after they had gone up to bed that ben with some hesitation spoke a thought which had been hovering round him all day there's one thing alec we might ask god for a way for him to go i know it said alec kicking his boot halfway across the floor but when a thing seems so impossible as this i can't somehow make up my mind to pray about it real out and out as you do when you expect something to come of it i know but there was effie the doctor thought that was impossible so he did and so did we but somehow you couldn't help praying about that it seems as though god could do those things better but alec did you notice the verse for the week no i haven't looked at the verse yet well it is a big verse i looked at it just after i had been thinking about this very thing and it almost knocked me over it was so sort of tacked on to the thoughts i'd been having what is it the things that are impossible with men are possible with god silence for a few minutes then alec as he roused himself to kick off the other boot said that is queer ben let us two do it do what ask the lord to do this impossible thing when you come to think of it i suppose it is very easy for him to do anyhow we can ask him and if he thinks best we know he can this was after they had been in bed for some minutes and were supposed to be asleep well said ben after a moment of thought i'm agreed so the compact was formed 
the days passed and the cough which the boys with wide open ears heard plainly now did not lessen neither did the mother's face grow less sad neither did the boys forget their agreement it was a crisp october afternoon no work on hand by which money could be earned and a nutting excursion had been planned effie was to go in her brother's care and at two o'clock they set out a party of twelve boys and more than that number of girls they passed judge morrison's office well he said coming to the door here is a company of you i ought certainly to be able to get my errand done which of you boys will go down to judge belmont's office with this package and get it there before the four o'clock train goes out none of us sir said charlie bacon with a sort of rude merriment we are bound for the woods and the nuts we have a contract with the squirrels to lay in our winter supplies to-day and give them full sweep after this judge morrison looked troubled i wish i could coax one of you he said persuasively i believe every boy whom i would like to trust with it is in your company it is quite important and my clerk is ill and i can't leave sorry sir said george strong i have my little sister in charge or i would go this was just as the boys trooped on lucky you have your sister to plead said charlie bacon laughing i have to get along without any such help what an old muff to expect us to give up our nutting to do his errands alec and ben exchanged glances i believe i'll go said ben in a low tone he was good to me last winter no said alec i had better go i don't think so i've been once this autumn for nuts you know and you haven't besides you promised to take care of effie it was you mother spoke to about being careful of her just as we came out of the gate i mean to go alec hold up boys i'll divide my basket of apples with you alec has the bread and butter and things to carry i'm going back such a chorus of voices greeted him i'd see old morrison in the river first said charlie bacon angrily selfish old fellow to expect any such thing and you are a born idiot if you go back we shan't have another nutting party this season ben merrily distributed his apples stopped his ears to shouts of entreaty and ran back breathless to judge morrison's office i'm glad it is you said the judge looking pleased i was thinking that if that charlie bacon should take a notion to come back i would hardly like to trust him with such important papers not that i had the least fear of his coming well if you get that safely into judge belmont's hands here is five shillings for your trouble then ben's eyes shone it was an easy way of earning five shillings now that he had decided to give up the nutting party a trifle over half a mile to judge belmont's office he decided to make all speed so as to be sure to be in time the package was given into the judge's hands and he expressed his thanks and ben was moving off when he caught a sentence from the tall gentleman who sat in the visitor's chair yes sir i've decided to build down there it is the prettiest spot in the west by all odds i've been all over that region the trouble is in securing reliable workmen i'd take a good hand down with me if i could find one who was willing to go at a reasonable figure the railroad fare wouldn't have to be considered you know i could pass him through just then the judge caught sight of ben's eyes what is it my boy he asked oh sir stammered ben i beg your pardon but i heard him say the west and i have been thinking so much about it and my father is a builder you know and he is very anxious to go there what is that said the stranger and judge belmont drew a chair and said come in my boy and tell us about it it was all arranged before night of the next day mr archibald's house was to be built in the west and mr browning was to have the job the impossible was as good as accomplished 
they talked it over those two eager boys that night while they were getting ready for bed he's done it again said ben with glowing cheeks and glistening eyes i say alec we may as well believe him always whether the things to do are possible or not end of chapter 12 end of the browning boys by pansy